What's up, mortals, and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the YouTube show about comparing film and TV to the books they're based on, and ya boy Terence micro-analyzing the Percy Jackson series on Disney+. Plus. An almost inconceivably huge thank you to my patrons for making what I do possible, especially the big three, April Mac, Shelby Holtz, and beloved Sylphine. To start at the beginning, there's the thing for everyone else, let's talk about episode seven, We Learn the Truth, sort of. <laughs> Percy enters a store selling luxury beds that's secretly being run by the giant Procrustes in human form, who, in keeping with his original mythos, lures people into laying on beds that trap the occupant. The trio give him a taste of his own medicine before entering the Underworld, where they negotiate with Charon, or Charon as Percy referred to him, then negotiate past Cerberus. Grover's flying shoes suddenly take on a life of their own and try to drag him into a very deep looking pit, only failing to do so because his hooves slipped out of them far easier than a human foot would have. Finally coming face to face with Hades, Percy is shocked to discover that the Lord of the Underworld played no part in half inching the lightning bolt and was in fact also the victim of theft himself after someone absconded with his fancy helm of invisibility. Percy is, to say the least, somewhat confused that the much coveted bolt is suddenly in his backpack, but puts two and two together quickly when he remembers that Ares gave it to him. Hades attempts to bargain with Percy by offering to return his mother to him, but Percy is forced to make the very hard decision to leave her behind so he can stop the God War. Using the Poseidon Pearls to teleport from the underworld to the sea, the trio find themselves on a beach and approached by a very well-armed naughty Ares. I have some feedback about Hades, but credit where credit's due, the show doesn't treat him as the butt of the joke like the film did, and didn't portray him as the evilest of the gods like most modern interpretations of him outside of the Percy Jackson book series. Hades is accurately portrayed as being a somewhat self-serving, but ultimately lawful neutral character. I have even more to say about the underworld, but hey, an insanely high rock ceiling with big stagmites, that is good, that is true to the book, and very nice touch that there's a second empty throne for Persephone, who is currently upstairs for the summer. Once again, Percy went to what was originally a random encounter on purpose, and once again saw right through a trap in advance that they absolutely fell for in the book. In the original context, they had simply ducked into that store to escape a group of human youths attempting to mug them. Amusingly, Ryden went out of his way to make it very clear that these were rich kids playing at being criminals, and he wasn't perpetuating any stereotypes about the underprivileged. In this particular case, I can see the value of cutting down on the time spent defeating Procrustes, by skipping over the part where Grover and Annabeth fell for his trick and got strapped into the beds by magical ropes that attempted to stretch them out into a perfect six foot, another reference to the original myth. It's not super relevant to the main plot, and some stuff does have to be whittled down. If this were the only example of Percy acting like he's read the Lightning Thief, I would have no problem with it. Bitty dubs, interestingly, the show acknowledges that Procrustes was another son of Poseidon, therefore Percy's half-brother, something that didn't come up in the book. The show fudges things a wee bit by having the gang enter the underworld through a secret entrance in the bed store, rather than the main entrance that was down the street in a building called DOA Recording Studios, an abbreviation for Dead on Arrival. A knock-on effect of this is we miss out on meeting Charon in his lobby full of waiting spirits and seeing his human presenting form, a man in a very expensive Italian suit. Instead, they briefly meet him looking like a cloaked figure moments before he sets Cerberus on them. Originally, Percy bribed him in to taking them across the River Styx by funding his obsession with snazzy clothing and promising to talk to Hades on his behalf about giving him a raise. And getting past Cerberus is a bit more action-packed in the show. Book Percy tried throwing a stick, then when that failed, Annabeth used a combination of a ball and a mummy dom voice to get him to submit to her. I'm not, you know, opposed to the more exciting version they went with in the show, though I will say it seems a little odd to me that Cerberus can be sent to sleepy nap times by what to him must have been the tiniest of scratches on one of his three heads. This is like a human being placated by a massage from an overly affectionate bee. Also, I know this isn't adaptation related, but did she just use the hand that she was holding herself up with to grab Percy? 
I kind of feel like there could have been a little more effort put into these stunts here. Oh, what a surprise. Percy finds the bolt before Hades calls him out for it. We are four for four on Percy knowing the plot in advance. So, the underworld. You know what, I don't care if this comes off as petulant, I didn't like it. Hear me out. The underworld in The Lightning Thief was divided into different fields. Elysium, the Isles of the Blessed, Punishment, Tartarus, and Asphodel, which are in order, kind of, but not exactly, Heaven, Super Heaven, Hell, Super Hell, and Meh. Asphodel is the neutral afterlife. People can either choose to go there to avoid judgment or be sent there after judgment. Grover describes it as standing in a wheat field in Kansas forever. The show goes in yet another eyebrow raising direction by making Asphodel a forest of people who got stuck there by having regrets in life and slowly turning into trees. In a surprise development, Annabeth gets nabbed by a regret root and has to use her teleportation pearl early. The reason I found this part in particular quite odd is I, I'm just not aware of any precedent for it in the Lightning Thief or Greek mythology itself. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's based on the seventh circle of hell from Dante's Divine Comedy. That forest of former people was a punishment for those who had chosen to end their own lives, a no-no in the Catholic religion, but aside from that, it's pretty spot on. And I don't know, I just find it weird that they borrowed an afterlife from a completely different religious fan fiction when the one more in keeping with the lightning thief was way more interesting anyway. I assumed that there would be some sort of narrative reason why Annabeth had to bounce before before meeting Hades, but if there was, I couldn't spot it. So one has to assume the point was to set up that Annabeth has a regret. Also, the implication is that neither Percy nor Grover have any regrets. Percy is cool with having left his mother behind with the Minotaur, and Grover stopped feeling bad about not getting Thalia to camp all of a sudden. The rest of the underworld is... <sighs> Well, I'm just gonna say it, it's kind of boring. I mean, it's just a big desert. Did Disney want to save on some funds by reusing the backdrops from Moon Knight or something? I mean, what's, what's going on here? It's also just super empty in the show. The only spirits you see are lining up outside or turning into foliage. Also, and I know this is off topic again, and I understand that it was the setup for some jokes about how people from New York are more adept at pushing past people, but the gang forcing their way down the line while there was clearly plenty of space to just walk alongside it made the whole thing feel rather forced. Anyway, the, the book described thousands of ghosts wandering around Asphodel or having a sick cookout party in Elysium. Show Hades' throne room is equally empty. Gone is his army of skeletal soldiers from dozens of different time periods, armed with everything from spears to rocket-propelled grenade launchers. And of course there is Hades himself. He was probably the part of this adaptation I've been anticipating the most this whole time, uh, both positively and nervously. My first stab of disappointment was admittedly no one's fault but my own, as I heard that Lance Reddick acted in this before he passed, assumed that he was playing Hades, and did no further research on this subject. So no shade on J2+, but him showing up was a bit of a letdown. But adaptation-wise, I, I, I have some pros and cons. This, more than anything else, gets a lot of leeway from me because it met the extremely low bar of at least treating this character with more respect than the film, and not forcing me to revive the calm intellectual filter. As I said before, I was relieved that he wasn't played as goofy, and there was no implications that he was the inspiration for Satan in any way, but to my dismay, they still didn't go with the original description of him from the book. Hades was, in Percy's words, the first god that he had met who actually looked like a god. He was a ten-foot-tall, pale, becrowned mother lover who radiated don't-fuck-with-me energy from every pore. His dark cloak would occasionally form the faces of the damned that he had sewed into it as punishment for their lives of evil when he moved around. He had a cloak made of faces, people. I don't know, making him into yet another character who clearly doesn't take himself very seriously gave me bathos vibes. Like the show is afraid to try and fail to make a genuinely intimidating character and getting mocked for it. The result of all of these changes is, in my opinion, a rather bland underworld and god of. In general, but especially in comparison with what it could have been if they'd chosen to recreate Raiden's more myth-accurate portrayal of it. This blandness extends to their new interpretations of characters like Charon. Italian suit wearing, borderline union forming, flexible morals Karen had personality. This guy has none. He's just he's a he's just a guy. He's a creepy guy in a cloak. 
This is nostalgia critic levels of original creativity. <sighs> anyway, Grover restores the Pearl status quo disrupted by the last episode by losing his. After which, Percy immediately, yet again, volunteers to sacrifice himself for the greater good. Someone, please get my poor, sweet boy some therapy. They added in a B-plot set a few years earlier that they keep cutting to like it's an episode of Lost, involving Percy being a dick to his mother about being transferred to a specialist school that tries to reject him in what has to be an extremely illegal or at least highly unethical way. The point of it was a little lost on me, aside from possibly making Percy feel like an extra piece of shit now that he's in danger of losing his long-suffering mama, and an excuse to introduce Percy Poseidon ahead of schedule. He was, alas, bereft of his leather sandals, khaki Bermuda shorts, and Tommy Bahama shirt with coconuts and parrots all over it, but he might still turn up in them at the end. Interestingly, Book Grover suggests that mortals might see the underworld differently depending on their beliefs. Uh, we also got a funny scene in the book where a corrupt televangelist was dragged out of line to be taken for special punishment that Hades had designed personally. Oh, and they skipped over a cameo from a colossal great white shark that Percy told to bugger off when the gang hearthstoned back to the beach that might or might not have been a dated reference to Jaws. Final thoughts. All in all, I'd say that this episode was about the same level of loyal to the book as every episode from number three onwards, i.e. it sticks to the main plot beats but gets to them in a different way. I'm not going to lie, mortals, this one felt unimaginative. I said I would be more accepting of changes if I thought they were an improvement, and I meant it, but I genuinely think this episode would have been a lot more engaging if they'd stuck a little closer to the book. I don't know, am I, am I being too harsh here? Is this good just not what I was expecting? Is, is no one else disappointed? I mean, I can't promise I'll shut up, but if you let me know, I'll take it under advisement. Anyways, like, share, comment, commit crimes. No, don't, don't commit crimes. Uh, click here to watch more Lost in Adaptation, or here to watch the last episode of the series when it's available. Terrence out.